God for the talents of our members of the church, lead by our pastor, of course. <laughs> Especially Shanique, I was impressed with the children's story. I enjoyed listening. Um, perhaps the moms guided her for that one. Thanks, thank you, moms, as well. <laughs> and for the message of song, thank you, Brother uh, Walter. Elena and Zach, as well as Liam, thank you for the scripture reading for doing. And praise God for this opportunity. Although I have stand here for a couple of times, but today it's different. I don't know why. I had a busy week, but uh, with the Holy Spirit, thank God will lead us and will give us the truth that we are looking for. So let's pray before we start. And our dear God, loving Father, as we spend a few minutes studying thy word, we pray for the Holy Spirit that you will touch us, that we will open our hearts to the words that we're going to study. Help us, to Lord, to follow you, no matter what, because we know that you love us so much. You have uh, created us, and you have redeemed us. And you're going to bring us to that kingdom where you have prepared for all of us. Thank you for everything, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So our title is, as you can see in the screen, Darkness to Light. I was uh, contemplating what topic I'm going to talk about. And since, because it's Christmas time, a holiday season, so I'm thinking about light. But to connect light... So I, well, it has to be a contrast. So there was a darkness. So this holiday season is often referred to as the season of lights. A, win a world of winter holidays, celebrations. But as we all know, lights represents to many different people. In autumn, for example, our Hindu brothers, along with the Buddhism, they have this called the Festival of Lights. The Festival of Lights. It's called um, Diwali. It's the Indian uh, Festival of Lights. It's also a festival of joy, prosperity, happiness, and usually happens in the month of between November, uh, October, November. And, and, and they have these uh, bright lanterns, they have big lights. This serves as a symbol of wisdom and triumph of good over evil. And we have also the Festival of Lights as one of the most beloved by the Jewish uh, brothers, the Jewish holiday. Meanwhile, as the children's story has been uh, mentioned, has been relayed to us, we have all the lights around us on this dark, sometimes dark, gloomy, cold winter season. We see plenty of lights around, right? Uh, homes have been decorated with kinds of uh, shimmering, what you call the shimmering, dazzling, um, what you call the uh, illumination, sparklings, big, small, white, and different colors in our twinkling Christmas trees. But all of this, people supposedly should be pointing to the one and only true light, the source of light, which is Jesus Christ. But in spiritual perspective, light represent what? A symbol of holiness, goodness, Knowledge, wisdom, grace, hope, and God's revelation. However, in contrast, darkness has been associated with evil, sin, and despair. But I firmly believe that God created light to help us to see. And I have no doubt that God doesn't want us to walk around stumbling in the, through the darkness. He even created light to become very powerful because even the tiniest of light can dispel any darkness. But on the other hand, 
darkness can never extinguish the tenuous of light. But listen to this, uh, uh, church. Light exposes what may otherwise stay hidden. Once upon a time, long, long time ago, not really long time ago, but a few decades or centuries ago, there was a boy named Robert. Maybe you're familiar with this story anyway. He was a sickly boy and who cannot go to school regularly. And so his parents, um, he decided to hire a teacher and at the same time as a nanny to help his personal needs. So one winter evening, his nanny uh, came to check on him. She saw Robert's uh, hands and, and, and face and nose pressed, pressed, pressed against the window. His nanny called him and told him to get back. But Robert said to her, come to the window and see what I'm seeing. Guess what? What's uh, down there? The nanny came to see down below on the street. There was what? Any clue? There was an alarm lighter. You know the story, right? Alarm lighter um, lighting the street lights of Glasgow, Scotland. It was called uh, the alarm lighter story. The alarm lighter a man named Leary, remember? And the poem that was written by Robert himself, Robert Louis Stevenson. You want to hear the poem? It's time. This is the, the poem itself. He said, My tea is nearly ready, and the sun has left the sky. It's time to take the window to see Leary going by. For every night at tea time and before you take your seat, with a lantern and with a ladder, he comes posting up the street. Now Tom would be a driver and Mar Maria go to the sea and my papa's a banker and as rich as he can be. But when I am stronger and can choose what I'm going to do, all leery, I'll go around at night and light the lamps with you. For we are very lucky with a lamb before the door. And Leary stops to light it as he lights so many more. And O oh, Leary, you hurry by with ladder, with light. But O oh, Leary, see a little child first and not to him tonight. That's an invitation for all of us. But uh, the complete change from oil to, electric to electricity means that the once familiar face of Leary, the lamp lighter with his ladder on his shoulder on his lighting pole will no longer be seen lighting street lamps in Glasgow. Back then, lamp light is definitely a necessity. Soul. Let's talk about soul. Soul was not a godless was was not a godless man himself. In fact, he was devoutly committed religious person, right? But he, he was on the wrong path. One day, we are familiar with his story. On his way to put men and women in prison for following Jesus, what stops him? The light, right? He saw the light, a bright light. And on, his, and on, on that moment, that light changed soul and he became old. A murderer to what? To a missionary. 
a church hater to a church planter. From among the most bitter and relentless persecutors of the Church of Christ arose a very skillful man, a very intelligent defender and most successful herald of the gospel. Why? Why did it happen to him? Because he yielded himself fully to the convincing, convicting power of the Holy Spirit. He acknowledged the mistakes of his life and recognized God. He who had been proud, Pharisee, Pharisee, confident that he was justified by his good works, now bowed before God with humility and simplicity as of a little child, confessing his own unworthiness and pleading the merits of a crucified risen Savior. No man ever lived who was more earnest, energetic, and self-sacrificing disciple of Christ than Paul. He was one of the world's greatest teachers of he crossed the seas, traveled far and near, until a large portion of the world had learned from his lips the story of the cross of Christ. He possessed a burning desire to bring perishing men to a knowledge of the truth through the Savior's love. Same thing, same thing, church, will happen to us when the light gets on us. He changes us. God has a way of turning our lives around. We know that he has unlimited supernatural resources that he freely offers us. And what do we need to do? All we need to do is surrender ourselves to him and take advantage of his unceasing love. And he promised that whosoever believes in him by grace through faith would be removed from the kingdom of darkness and live into the brightness of God's eternal kingdom of light. That's the promise. Church, we cannot live in the light and live in the darkness at the same time because light and darkness cannot share together. But sadly, nowadays, people, people love, love darkness rather than light. And some people are quite comfortable living, living in partial darkness. Meaning, they have received a certain light, but they would not accept any more light. So instead of growing in the illumination, they were in partial darkness. They lived in both some light and with some darkness. There are people in our community live in darkness and don't even realize and don't even realize it. Allow me to tell you another story for illustration purposes. There was a man. This is an old story as well, an old story about um, uh, a nomad. You know what a nomad is? A man uh, lives in the open field. There are millions of them around the world, well, particularly in uh, Jordan, Morocco, uh, Egypt, and then in Saudi Arabia. These people are called this desert dwellers. They're desert dwellers who traverse the sand. They are called the Bedouins. I met them when I was in Saudi. Most of them, they're very tough people. And they're very... Um, so we say hot tempered sometimes. <laughs> because if, they, if you don't give them what you want, they go there sometimes, like for instance, for example, you go to the A&E, and I have a head a toothache. And these uh, Bedouins, like the, the, um, the, what you call this, the original people of Saudians, they said, I want x-ray, I want ECG. What does related to your head uh, to your toothache for that matter? 
But you have to do that still. You need to do x-ray, you need to do ECG, whatever the request you have to follow. So these are kind of, kind of people. But some of them are nice, are good. Not all of them, though. But, um, you know, these people are very tough. They can survive in harsh weather condition and even live in a very difficult environment. But uh, the story goes, one time, a desert nomad woke up in the middle of the night. And so what he did, he lit a little candle, picked one date from the bowl beside his table, and start eating it. But uh, during uh, this time, he noticed a worm, you know. He noticed a worm. And so, and so when he saw the worm in it, he, so he threw it out. He threw it out of the tent. So he took another one, the second date, and found another worm. And again, he threw it away as well, also. But in his mind, he was thinking and reasoning. What would I do if all of this have got worms? And so instead, what did he do? You might be able to guess. He continued uh, reasoning in his mind that he would have any dates left to eat. If he continued throwing the dates, he blew out the candle and quickly ate the rest of the dates. Right? Of course, perhaps, including the worms. Have you tried that? Maybe eating the worms in one of the bread and you discovered, oh, there's a worms? And, but you have already tasted it. <laughs> and then, that's the illustration, actually. Because there are amongst us, or people, prefer darkness. You know why? Because in the light, they can see too much. They can see too much. And not just that it's hard for them to continue... And not just that, because it is hard for them to continue on their old ways. Sometimes I don't even like having a light shine, because it shows my relationship with God, which is perhaps in a very terrible mess. The Bible says, men love darkness rather than the light, for their works are evil. Let's be perfectly honest with ourselves. Everything is not as neat and tidy as we thought, right? There are a mess that needs to be cleaned up. And even though we have tried to hide the mess in the darkest and in the most private corners of our lives, the light of Jesus has revealed or has shown us that there is some dirt piled up there that needs cleaning out. Let me give you some examples. Our, our secret sins, perhaps. Those faults that we would prefer not to admit. The poor way we have treated the people, even those people that we love. The selfish attitude that we have nurtured. The times we have preferred to look to, other way, to the other way than offer a helping hand. But this uh, uh, church this morning, Jesus said, remember, I am looking into each of your hearts. And I would like to require each and every one of you to be faithful to me, to be peculiar in faith and character. Yes, Jesus exposes those private corners of our life that we prefer to keep hidden, but he guides us along life's, our life's journey. He dispels the darkness of guilt with his forgiveness. But each of us must decide. Each of us must decide for ourselves what to do. Either we have to receive his light in our life or reject his life 
and stay in darkness. Because there's no other way. It's only through Jesus. The true life from above that shines and not the shimmering, um, what you call this uh, in Iceland, Aurora Borealis. He's offering you his life, a life beyond this life, the eternal life, which is the very best Christmas present we could ever have. God requires his people to shine as lights in the world. It's not merely the, the ministers or the elders or the church. All of us required to do this. Our conversation should be heavenly. As Seventh-day Adventists, we have been set as light bearers of the world. Each of us is to be bright and shining light, showing forth the praises of him who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. So if you are going through a season of life where you do not know where you are going or what are you going to do with your life, maybe you are still living in partial or still even stuck in the darkness. Let's remember that Jesus has done all to redeem us out of the darkness. Let's be encouraged today because no matter what dark place we currently navigating, God is also there lighting the way. But all we need to do, all it requires is to focus on that light, accept him, allowing him to be our guide. So when we face the deep darkness of our life, whether a loss of income because of COVID perhaps, sadness or despair, struggling with an illness, the aches, the pains of old age, losing the struggle with failing abilities and entering perhaps into a nursing home. We're not beyond hope. No matter how deep the darkness, the light of God's love and truth overcomes every scene that separates us from him. His love never changes. In his light, we find the strength to carry on. In his light, the darkness around us and in the lives of others is replaced with hope, love, and forgiveness. Certainly, we're still living in a very dark world. We know biblically that this world is temporarily ruled by Satan, the prince of darkness. In fact, his kingdom is called the domain of darkness. Despite our good intentions, we all are sinners alike. Sins like pride, gossip, gluttony, I should say are pervasive or maybe prevalent in our church environments. <laughs> Pardon me to say that. And can just do as much damage as seemingly worse sins like adultery, envy, and pride. All our, our lives must be about finding, always finding, always come to the source of light for guidance. So let's move out from darkness and stay in the light by making the step journey of hope in Christ today. Jesus promised, I have come into the world as a light so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. We have seen his glory who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Receive the light of Jesus into your life. Just as the Son provides physical life to the world, Jesus, the Son of God, is the spiritual light of the world the light that has come into the world to overcome the darkness of sin. When we follow Jesus, his light leads us, it nourishes, it nourishes us, comforts us, guides us along our path, and our lives will have meaning and purpose. Light is the source of all life on our planet. The plant bends where? towards the light. When light comes from an angle, plants will curve towards the light. But for us, we curve no different 
or not on the light sometimes. So to get better access to the lights so that the plant can grow because they need the energy and strength that only the sun can provide. The human body needs to be exposed to natural sunlight and its rhythm to function properly. Exposure to natural light help our bodies produce vitamin D, improves our blood circulation, rhythms, and give us a good sleep patterns. Help us to focus, enables us to get more things done, and even makes us happier. Because getting enough of these vital resources is the key to our physical and psychological well-being. Finally, church, our conclusion is the true light, Jesus Christ, with deep agony, overcame against the power of darkness. He made his way slowly through the garden of Gethsemane, through his unfair trials, crying from the cross with his parting breath, he cried out, it is finished. Satan was defeated, heavens overjoyed in triumph. He knew that his kingdom was lost, that Satan's kingdom was lost. The cross, is, if you look at it, it is the very center of our salvation history. In the end, we are totally saved or totally lost. There is no middle ground here. We can either have eternal life or will face eternal destruction. But God has chosen for all of us to be saved. And that even before the world began, we were chosen by him to have eternal life. Yes, some people will still be lost. And that's because though God has chosen us all, he has given us the most sacred gift and that is the free will. God has given us the power of choice. It is ours to exercise. We cannot change our hearts. We cannot change, we cannot control our thoughts, our impulses, our affections. We cannot make ourselves pure, fit for God's service. But we can definitely choose to serve God. We can give him our will. Then he will work for us according to his good pleasure. Thus, our whole life, our nature will be brought under the control of Christ. So church, it's my um, prayer and invitation for all of us today that we will strive to walk in the light as Christ is in the light. God bless us. This is my prayer.